So good afternoon and welcome. I've been asked to moderate this afternoon. My name is Melanie Aaron. I'm a rabbi at Congregation Shir Hadash, which is down in Los Gatos, so down in the southern direction. And I'm glad to spend this uh, eighth day of Hanukkah uh, with everyone. It's a wonderful way to uh, spend the time thinking about the Jewish people, thinking about the issues that confront us today. Before we get started, I just want to ask everyone to check their cell phones. I'm sure you've been asked to do this before, to make sure they're not beeping or buzzing or otherwise interrupting us. And I've been asked to explain that we will have some questions at the after about halfway through our session. But we'd like to remind you that these are meant to be questions and not alternative speeches. I came for the end of the last program, and I saw the poor moderator really struggling with that. So please, uh, you know, as you think of things, you can jot them down, but be sure we're asking a question to our panelists. Um, many of you are familiar with Zionist thinkers, and we know that Achad Ha'am and others look to a Jewish future um, that would be like different times in the past when there was a large population in Israel and a large population of Jews living somewhere else in the diaspora, an important cultural exchange between these two communities. As we enter this new era, we wonder what does, what should this cultural exchange look like? What might it look like in the future? So we have with us Israeli playwright Michala Haroni, an American Jewish thinker, Dan Lieberson, who has translated some novels uh, from Hebrew, Israeli novels into English. And they will discuss some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that face us in this next century. Um, Dan is going to speak first. I'll introduce him. Is the founder and president of the Institute for the Next Jewish Future. And I got to see one of your uh, TED Talks, so it mm -hmm. gave me a sense of what you're doing. And co-host of Judaism Unbound, which is a, a podcast that's well received. A lawyer and a translator. He has extensive background in Jewish cultural innovation and served for six years as the executive director of the University of Chicago Hillel. He's also the recipient of the prestigious Avichai Fellowship. And the, one of the books that I know he translated, The Orchard uh, by Yochi Brandes, sounds very interesting, historical fiction with quite a, a twist. In Hebrew, I believe it was known as Hapardes Shel Akiva. Michala Haroni is an Israeli playwright and columnist based in New York City. Her writing deals with politics and the Israeli-Arab conflict based on her own experience and work in the political arena. Uh, she is often published in Yisrael Hayom. During the past several years, she has worked as a spokeswoman for many Israeli politicians. Um, her play, Sar HaBitachon Yehudi Lev Aravi, which um, was a little bit of a humorous play. Did, is that the one that came here to yeah, Palo Alto? Right there, right there, yeah. uh, all right, and we hope it will come back so the rest of us will get to see it. Um, she was part of the Israeli delegation to the Peace Summit in Camp David in 1999. For fuller biographies, we encourage you to look online, and there is a more extensive biography for both of our speakers. So we're going to invite uh, Dan to begin and open up our session. Thanks. So um, I, I want to, I, I, we're going to have a little conversation and then open it up to you. I mean, I think we're really interested in, in your questions. Um, so if we're not speaking to what you're interested in, you know, start raising your hands early, I would say. But I hope, I hope that we will. I, um, I want to tell you a little story about how I kind of got involved in the world of um, cultural exchange, let's say, or, or, or trying to build a, a, a Jewish culture together with Israel. I was, um, this was early on in my career of trying to think in, in sort of radical ways about Judaism. And uh, maybe it was about 10 years ago, uh, maybe a little less. And I, my sister lives in Israel. And I was t having a conversation with my sister where I said, it, it would be really great if there was a novel where about, about sort of ancient Israel, where the good guys were the northern kingdom, you know, and, and the bad guys were the southern kingdom. And, you know, that we would, because, not, not because I necessarily believe that's true or not true, but it would give us a different Jewish story to hang our hat on. It would give us a different mythology that might 
better support certain innovations. Because if you know about the Northern Kingdom, um, which was destroyed about 150 years before the Southern Kingdom, it was much more plugged into the world around it. It was much more uh, part of the um, part of the the you know Assyrian and, and Mesopotamian world. Uh, it was much more pluralistic, and and uh, it would have potentially been a really interesting. Um, you know, that's where the 10 lost tribes came from. And, and that, that, that maybe we could say, hey, we're continuing their story rather than the Judean story, which is full of zealots and religious fundamentalists and uh, people fighting uh, wars that they can't win. Uh, and I guess the Northern Kingdom did that too. Um, and anyway, I, I, t I said to my sister, it would be great if there was a novel like that. And she said, oh, there actually there is. It just came out not too long ago here in Israel. It was called, um, in Hebrew, Malachim Gimel. And in English, it was finally translated as The Secret Book of Kings. Um, and it's, it's the story um, uh, of, of uh, basically the Jeroboam, who's the, king of the, the, the first king of the northern uh, tribes of Israel, and, um, and also told by Michal, the, the wife of King David, who was Saul's daughter. Um, and it kind of portrays Saul as a good guy and David as a bad guy. So, so I read this book, and I felt like, you know, it's not exactly what I, what I meant when I said that we should have this novel. But it's, it's, a it's good enough, and it's doing a lot of this work. And it's tragic that it's not accessible to American readers who don't speak Hebrew. And so I, as you can do in Israel um, differently, you know, you can't really drop an email to JK Rowling or she won't reply. But you can, uh, this was actually, I think, one of the biggest bestsellers in Israeli history. And you can just send an email to, you know, an Israeli uh, celebrity and, and she'll actually write back. And I said, is this book being uh, translated? And she said, oh, I've had so many struggles. And uh, long story short, we, we ended up working together and got the book sold to a major US publisher and, and translated. Um, and I ended up doing a lot of the editing of that translation such that when it came time to do the second book, I, I was the translator for it myself. Um, and, and I think that for me, what I'm struggling to, to think about is what is the nature of this relationship? You know, Chad Ha'am talked about the idea that um, if there were to be a state or a national home in Israel, that it would become the cultural center of Jewish culture and that somehow those of us who lived in the diaspora would, would draw from it, like drawing from a well. Um, but not so much that we would necessarily have much to contribute, I don't think. Uh, contrast to another Zionist thinker, Simon Ravidovich, who talked about an ellipse which has two foci, and that there would be two important centers of, of uh, Jewish culture, and that somehow the Jewish culture or Judaism, or Jewish, or whatever the Jewish people would be in orbit around both of those those foci. That's very intriguing to me and very interesting. I, I want that to be true. And then the question becomes, I think, how do we uh, really make it true between uh, two societies, which actually are, at least in terms of their cultural work, are doing it in different languages, right? That um, we may or may not speak one another's language, but when we're creating culture, we're generally doing it in our, in our native language. Um, so the, the, the last thing that I'll say uh, as a beginning to this is that as a translator, I've started to feel more and more, and this may be a little controversial, that American Jews shouldn't spend their time learning Hebrew, that it's not realistic that most American Jews are going to learn Hebrew, not because they don't care about being Jewish or they don't care about Hebrew. The sad truth is that Americans don't learn any language. And by the way, this is true about any nation that is the kind of dominant uh, cultural nation of its time. I don't think the Romans spoke uh, you know, other languages very well. They didn't need to. And something, and I don't know what it is, uh, maybe maybe certain sociologists could tell us, but there's something that makes it actually culturally difficult to learn a language because why should Americans actually speak no other languages? Whereas if you go to you know like Holland, they speak better English than we do. So it's not because of they, they're smarter than us. It's something about living in certain societies. And the fact is that we live in America, and we're not good at learning languages. And so I don't think we're ever going to learn Hebrew. So that actually creates, I think, an interesting role for a translator and for the idea of translation to say that 
um, that, that whether we really need to invest in the capacity of taking the cultural product from one society or the other and making it available to the other, because only, only that way will we, will we have a chance to really um, get, get a, a deep understanding of, of, this, of the cultures in each place and potentially have a way of having true cultural exchange where we would actually be able to potentially build some kind of Jewish culture together in the future. So those are my opening ideas. And, and I don't know, Michal, if that makes you, if it, it raises anything for you or if you want to talk about other things, no, no, you're let, welcome let's to. Talk, let's talk about translation for a second. I know that you know, I really, it took me about five years to understand that there is nothing like this a problem in the States. There is a challenge. It's always a challenge. There is no, pro no problem at all. But it has to do a lot with what, the, with what you said. It took me five years. I mean, I'm here for like almost six years. And it took me five years to understand something which is basic about culture. It's a cultural thing. It's not that there aren't any problems. Obviously, we're all dealing with problems. We're all facing problems. But the culture, it's something much, it's, it's deep inside that American people look at things as a challenge, while Israelis look at things as a problem. And if it, there is a problem, there is a solution. But if it's a challenge, you can talk about it for hours. And you don't need to find a solution. Because it's a challenge, it's not a problem. So when you're saying that you know, people will never learn Hebrew, it's not only about the language. It's about a culture. It takes time to understand what people mean. What, you know, for example, at the beginning, people told me, let's have coffee sometime. And, and I said, yes, great. I didn't understand that they don't want to see me anymore. <laughs> It took me like two years to understand that there will be no coffee. Never, ever. I should buy my, my own coffee and that's it. <laughs> or, for example, things like you're sending an email and they never answer you because they don't want to say no. They don't want to be the people that will say no, that will hurt your feelings. So they just disappear. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Wow, thank you. No, it just... You know, you, you say you say I appreciate I appreciate it to anyone. You know, it doesn't matter if he helps you to you know to cross the road or if he saved your life. You appreciate it, and that's it. And and it takes time to understand all these small nuances. That so you can spend your whole life trying to understand what people say, and it's not about the language. It's about an attitude. It's about the culture. It's about the moment you understand that the things that people say are not exactly the things that you understand. <laughs> and there is a huge gap between. And when, when you're Israeli and you come to the States, you, you actually believe you understand the culture. And you know why? Because you watch Woody Allen's films. So obviously, I, I know the States. I have been in New York for like three times in Manhattan. I, uh, you know, I, I, I watched Woody Allen's films. Understand nothing. And I guess it's the same, you know, with Americans that had, you know, in Israel, because they think we're rude. No, we're not rude. We just talk like this. You see? You see? I just, you know, my, my son told me, don't use your hands all the time. <laughs> You got people, people are going to feel you're, 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 not, you're offending them. But no, we're not. That's the way we are. So when you come to talk about, you know, about language and about culture, it's better to have a great translator and translation than trying to understand it in Hebrew. Why not? It's not about giving up. It's not about being, uh, you know, a better Jew if you speak a good Hebrew. No, it has nothing to do with it. It just has to do with the fact that, you know, my English will never be perfect. It will never be perfect because I came here in the age of 39 and never in my life I spoke English, you know, but with whom? With my Russian grandmother. I, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, yes, 
I, I feel very grateful to Mrs. Millis, who was my, uh, my English teacher when I was like, I think, 14, and she was Brit, and she, re and she, you know, she didn't understand where Israel is, although she lived in Israel for like 30 years, and she, she was very anxious to teach us English. So. But that's the way it is. So instead of you know, insisting on, fine, speaking, let's speak Hebrew, no. If there is a good translation, if there is someone who can understand both Hebrew and English and the connection between and, 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 and the cultural you know, nuance, that's great. Why not? Can we look at that as a metaphor um, in, the, in the following sense? Um, if the, I was thinking earlier that sometimes with our, the idealistic thinking about Zionism from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, there were hopes of what could be that were unrealistic or that didn't sort of imagine that what, what naturally happens if you live in two societies that are both successful uh, is, that, is that strong cultures will develop in both societies that will be different cultures from one another. And if you think about um, family members you know, we have siblings, and the next generation, their cousins, and the next generation, their second cousins, and by the time they're third cousins, you're lucky if they show up at the family reunion. And and these are some <laughs> of the challenges that we're we're facing. And yet, I think that what I was trying to do in translating Yochi Brandis's books was to say, our culture of of American Judaism needs these novels, and maybe they could only have been produced in Israel, maybe not, but they weren't really being produced in America. That's not to say that there weren't um, biblical or historical Jewish novels published in America, but they weren't as deeply connected to the texts and trying to really uh, look at all the different nuances and, and, and bring them forward into our time in a way that, so, so I, I, I was trying to sort of bring something from this culture into that culture, which is very different from building a, a, a joint Jewish, a, you know, a new Jewish culture together. Yeah. And I guess the question is, what is really possible? I need to ask you something which is really important. When you see the text in Hebrew and you see the text in English, are there any differences you can actually say we have changed something in order to make it more uh, 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 comfortable or much easier for the American audience, or is it like you know copy paste? It's obviously not copy paste. So what was the thing? What was the main thing that you were trying? It's not even it's not even translation. It's an adaptation. Right. So I want to point you a little bit to um, this question of literature. And Michal was mentioning that she loved uh, Philip Roth, who we've talked about a lot this year. But Philip Roth was part of a generation of American writers like Bello, who were Jewish by birth, but kind of fought against being viewed as Jewish authors. And we have on the American scene now a whole generation of younger writers who are very much in their Judaism and much more um, willing to identify as Jewish writers, to deal with Jewish issues. I feel like Israeli writers maybe are going in the other direction. How do we go across this uh, different way of looking at literature? And what does that mean for Israeli writers that American writers are into their Judaism in a different way? I, I, I don't write things because others write things. You know, if people can write whatever they want and whatever they feel like, I, I write things that I like to write. So if there is like, you know, there are like 10 American writers who write about one issue, then it's okay, but I'm, I'm not going to follow the issue just because they do that or just because they write about it. Uh, so in, in a way, I think that, you know, it wasn't until I came here that I realized I write Jewish plays because I wrote plays. And then only when I came here, I realized that this, because this whole thing about Judaism here, in Israel, you're a majority. When you are a majority, you think in a different way. When you are a minority, you think in a different way. Because when you are a majority, you don't have to deal with who you are and what you are all the time and how do you need to keep yourself as a Jew, because the, you're Jewish, you go to school and all the holidays are there. And you go around and all the holidays are 
there and everything is there and people deal with it and people talk about it and it's part of your life. And it took me a while to understand that here I turned up to be a minority and it's a completely different point of view about life. So maybe, maybe, I, I'm not sure, you know, I didn't talk to, 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 that, to, to these writers, but maybe the, the, the young generation here, they need it more because they feel like, you know, Judaism is running away from them and they kind of need to pull it back. Israelis don't need to do that because they're already, it's a Jewish state. And it's hard to, un I, I know it's hard to understand sometimes, but for me, for example, to, to be in Manhattan, it's more complicated. I, I live in Riverdale, which is in the Bronx. I like the Bronx more than I like uh, uh, Manhattan. Why? Because in Manhattan, I feel a minority. Oh, and and in, in, in the Bronx, I feel a minority, but the privileged one, because I'm white and I can afford things that other people can't, and, and I, I can't, and I speak more English than most of the people around me. <laughs> for, for them, I'm Shakespeare. They look at me and they see Shakespeare. She has arrived, you know, and they think Shakespeare was a woman. But, but uh, uh, in, in Manhattan, I am, I am totally a minority when I, so it's, it's a, you don't need that in Israel. Uh, so you write about yourself and you don't need to look for Judaism because it's already there. It's, you know, you, you just need to pick it up. And maybe, maybe because uh, Americans, you know, maybe American Jews are, you know, are minorities. They need to find a way to connect or to be connected with their Judaism. Maybe, I don't know. I, I, would, I would just say, like, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's actually what's happening. I mean, I think what we're seeing is, is two mature cultures. And I think that what we're seeing with the young writers in Israel is that they're writing about Israel because they don't need to write about Judaism. It's not their, Judaism is not their culture. Israel is their culture. And like Michal is saying, there's a lot of Judaism permeating through Israel, perhaps. But, and, and they don't have to be conscious of it. Um, it but, but they're just writing about their culture. And the American Jewish young writers are also writing about their culture, which happens to be more permeated with Judaism uh, than it was in Philip Roth's time and Saul Bell's time for various reasons. But, but, but I, but I think that, um, but I think that, in many ways, I think that that actually is a good example of what I see. What I see as the divergent cultures, and the question is to me: Are those cultures completely on a divergent course, or is there some way in which? ties between them can and should be should be built and and I'm not sure you know I think one question that we were talking about earlier was whether anything written in Hebrew is inherently Jewish culture and in a way the question is is there a larger circle called Jewish culture inside of which live American Jewish culture and Israeli culture or are there two different cultures, American Jewish culture and Israeli culture, that have a little bit of a Venn diagram overlap? I think it's more the latter. Um, so what would you say about um, Israelis who are arguing that now that Zionism isn't the ideology that embraces all of their life, that you have things like the secular yeshiva and people looking for something else to replace what Zionism once was, and for some people that is a, a, a searching into Judaism, not the Haredi Judaism, but a different kind of Judaism. That wow, I, you know, my, my, most of my friends uh, in Israel, you know, they're actors or some of them, they, they're all working on something because that's the way actors are. I mean, they're all working on, and they all, they're all writing plays at the moment. <laughs> so, um, but we don't think, uh, we don't think of it as, as a Jewish culture. We write about things that have to do with our life. And apparently, for example, you know, especially now when, when Judaism has to do a lot with politics in Israel, all of a sudden, it turned up to be like, 
You know, it's not just a culture, it's not a religion, it's, you know, it's an ideology, Judaism, which is, it wasn't like this before, then in a way, people like me or my friends, they reject it by writing about it. Or they, you know, they stand for other values, but uh, when you come, I mean, if you if you do need to think about it, then it, it has nothing to do with culture, it has to do with politics. Because in Israel at the moment, Judaism uh, turned out to be a political issue instead of cultural or uh, religious issue. So what we do in our art is, we're, you know, in my satire, the, it, we're talking about the Israeli defense minister who needs a heart trans, uh, transplant. But a few months before he collapsed, he issued a bill that uh, Jews cannot get organs from non-Jewish people. And now the only heart available is from, you know, a Palestinian heart from someone who passed away in Hebron. So, and he needs to decide whether he's breaking the law or he dies. Now, it's funny. I mean, I don't know if you find it funny, but I find it really funny because politicians who need who need to save themselves, they turn up to be less ideological <laughs> about things. <laughs> so, and, 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 it, you know, and, and there is like a moment where they need and they take the heart and they convert him to Judaism. <laughs> and and the, 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 the guy, he doesn't know what to do. So, he, you know, he takes it, he holds the heart in his hand. And he looks at the and he knows that he needs to convert the heart because he signed a deal with 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 a, a minister of defense, and he looks at the heart and the heart you know looks at him and it's like to be or not to be what with the heart, and 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 then he doesn't know what to do and he takes his um, uh, and he puts it on the heart so at least it will be a kosher. <laughs> so. And and I you know I find it funny because it's like you take sim, you, you take Judaism and you turn it into satire. But I don't know if if it would have worked here. We, you know, maybe some people will find it offensive because you know in this we're Israelis they find things less offensive than Americans, uh, and and Americans find things very offensive all the time. <laughs> I mean, it seems like people actually looking for a way to get hurt. So I, so I don't know if it would have worked here in, you know, and, and it's another question, humor. Can you translate humor? Can you, you know, can you bring to life humor in a different language, in a different culture? It's pretty, it's pretty complicated, especially satires. It has to do with, you know, with, you know, with cultural atmosphere. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know. It, it, it seems like the, the one, the, you know, the situation with the yeah. with the Amoka worked here. Yeah. So you know, I'm not sure about the other situations in the in the satire. There's a lot of problems with sterile conditions in, in, the, in the play. There was, <laughs> yeah, nobody yeah. was wearing gloves. Was, no, was, yeah, was, I mean, they will think that you know, Israeli hospitals yeah. are like in in India or you know, <laughs> in round town neighborhoods in India. <laughs> but I think that that's, uh, that, that's part of the, the challenge. And, and I guess um, in terms of uh, the question of translation is that there's always a lot that's lost in translation. In a way, the question is whether there's enough gained in translation that makes it worth doing. And, and I think that that's the, that, that's the question um, in, in terms of this part of the project. And I think also the, the cultural stuff is also just a metaphor, even also for the political stuff. Because ultimately, we're talking about translation of all kinds of, of dimensions of these cultures. And the question is, is there, you know, is there enough value to doing it that, that it's worth doing, meaning are, is there still hope that we are really a people? And, and my question is, you know, if, there's, if you say that you're part of a people, but you can't understand one another's jokes, or you can't understand one another's music, are you really a people? And if you're not, then what do you do? That, that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah, but it has to do, I mean, it doesn't mean that Jews have to, you know, all the Jews have to laugh about, uh, about everything. I mean, we're different people at the end of the day. So, uh, obviously, things that will make me laugh 
there are things, you know, that look at, you know, we always laugh at someone else's misfortune. This is a rule. That's how it works in life. You see someone, he walks on the street, he sleeps. There is a banana, he sleeps on the banana. You're laughing because it's funny. He, he, that's his misfortune. He might broke his leg, okay? So, but this is a rule. This is rule number one in humor. Now the question is, and it's and, and with culture, is is this man has is is disabled, for example? Is it still funny? If this person is a, a you know a very old lady, is it still funny? And then you start to realize that you know there are like certain situations that always make you laugh, but. Culture is about, you know, it, it's about, it's not about the similarity. It's, it's also mm -hmm. about the differences. And, and I don't know, sometimes I think, I believe, is Israeli, I mean, when you translated Yochi Brandes, I, I read Yochi and I love her. I, you know, I love her writing. But I'm not, I'm not sure there is something offensive in Yochi's writing, but with other writers, there are people that I would have said never, ever, don't even try to translate them. Mm. Because it's not part of the, it, you know, people, most of the people will find it not interesting or, or offensive or whatever. Well, there was, a, there was one um, uh, comedy sketch that I, I saw a while ago that I, that I think is a, is a great example of what's possible. So there's a show called Hayyuhudim Ba'im in oh, Israel. The Jews are coming, and it's a sketch comedy show that looks at the Bible and other Jewish historical events and, and, and it pokes <laughs> fun at that, which <laughs> I, I wonder if that's, a, a, if that's an example of something that does translate quite well, because a lot of us do know at least those stories from the Bible. But one of them was, um, it's a scene, and I don't know if uh, any of you are, are Seinfeld fans in the room, but there was a famous uh, element of Seinfeld where they finally, in the story, get a chance to do a show, and they say, what's the show going to be about? And they say, it's going to be about nothing. nothing. <laughs> and they're like, it's going to be about nothing? How's it going to be about nothing? It's a, it's a whole big thing. So on Hayyuhudim Ba'im, there's a sketch where Abraham is sitting with, I guess, Lot, and he's saying, you know, I have this new idea. It's a god, but there wouldn't be any, any statue, and there wouldn't be any, um, he wouldn't be the god of, you know, uh, fertility, and he wouldn't be the god of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, harvesting and war and rain. So what would be the god of? Nothing. He would be the god of nothing, you know, and they're fighting over this thing, like, wait, there would be no statue, no god, there's the god of nothing, and, you know, and actually it was quite brilliant, and it was, and it was, and, you know, Seinfeld is not just any American comedy, right? Seinfeld is Jewish American comedy, I would say, um, in terms of sensibility, and, um, and, and, and so to sort of bring that into dialogue with the book of Genesis was a, an interesting example of taking, I think, strands that developed and that could only have developed in Israel and strands that could have only developed in America and, and bringing them together in a new way. But the writers of the Yudim Be'im, I, 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 I know, I just know one of the writers. And they are people who brought up, you know, one of them was brought up in the States and the other one is re really familiar with American culture. And it has to do a lot with, you know, with the ability to communicate between two cultures. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, God about nothing, God of nothing, it might be very offensive to some people. In, in, and, and in Israel, it's like, you know, it's funny. So they took something from here and they took something from there and they kind of combined between things. And you can find it in many sketches that they wrote, but it has to do with the fact that one of them was brought up here and is really familiar with the culture. And the, and, and the, the woman, she's a friend of mine's uh, wife, uh, she is really familiar with American culture because otherwise she couldn't bring, they couldn't bring to life this line you know, about nothing. Mm -hmm. It's only if you, Really, if, well, you know, if you're really familiar with Seinfeld and you really like it, uh, you need to like it a lot in order to put it in your stuff. So there's another unfortunate point of contact. This is a wonderful point of contact, and I promise we're going to take some questions. 
But that is the attacks on artists and journalisms right now in both cultures. In Israel, there was that attempt at loyalty. Um, uh, it, it seems to be off the table right now. In the United States, the attack on journalists, which really also are attacks on artists. So what is the responsibility of the writer, the translator, the artist um, in a society that, that is not supportive of an independent voice? Just to write, to keep writing. Because the moment you, st it's not about them stopping you, it's about you stopping yourself. It's a, the moment you start to <coughs> be worried or to be afraid, this is the moment where they won. They don't have to do anything anymore because you censorship yourself. And this is the moment where, you know, and, and again, this is something when I, where I, I find it sometimes hard to explain to American people because here culture is private. You don't get any support from the government. In Israel, most of, you know, most of the, without support, without money from the government, there is no culture. You can't. It's a completely different system. There is nothing like, you know, like the, the Israeli system and the American system is so different that you can't even compare, start comparing between them. So, but our responsibility to keep writing, you know, my satire, none, none of the theaters wanted to produce it. And I was like, why? And then a friend of mine told me, because they don't produce satires, why do they have to? You know, they don't need it. So I, I raised money. By, I started by raising money myself. I used Head Start as a, as a, as a platform, and I raised about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 and from friends, you know, friends, family, people who heard about it, people who came to listen to it because we did like a stage reading. And then well, Tzavta Theater, which is, you know, which is a small theater in Tel Aviv, just joined me. And we ended up, we, we now had like 140 shows, and we're still running. We ended up you know, with a huge success. But at the same time, um, I did something in Habima last year, uh, a play called AKA Versace. Nothing to do with satire, I swear to God, nothing against the government, but the the um, the actress she she was naked on stage for like three minutes, so I didn't write it like this. I I, I wrote the scene in a completely different way. But the um, but the uh, about you know talking about translation, the director because I'm here he texted me, which means I'm taking out the the nudity. I was like, okay, if, that, if, if you feel uncomfortable with nudity, then it's okay. He meant, I, I'm, I'm bringing it, bringing it out. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exposing. Exposing, <laughs> yeah. And when I came to the first show, I realized <laughs> that the actress, she just stands naked in front of the audience for like three minutes. It was a beautiful scene. But at the same time, very uncomfortable to some people, including my mom, which I could hear, you know, in a premiere. And she said, you know, in, in a loud voice, because she's like, you know, she, she's my mom, and that's how it works with her. She was saying, what the hell did she do? What the hell? And I was like, no way, mom, please shut up. I mean, so, so. <laughs> And, and the actress, she, you know, and, and she wasn't as that beautiful as my mom wanted her to be. And, you know, no, I don't. So, and, and, after, uh, and after a while, Miri Regev, the Minister of Culture, she wrote a letter to the um, to, uh, Israel Festival uh, that she's not going to support the festival because there's like a show with nudity. So, a day after, we got, um, I, I, the director uh, got a call from the theater asking him to take care of the nudity. Do something about the nudity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. My, my, my mom would appreciate your comment. So, uh, so uh, 
he obviously, you know, he, he stood up uh, for art and he said, no way, we're not going to do it. We're already, you know, the, the critics were there already. We got great reviews. What, uh, you, know what, you know what they did? They broke the contract. They just took the show down. Uh, uh, and uh, no explanation, nothing. They just, you know, they just emailed my agent. They told him that unfortunately uh, they can't sell tickets and uh, it doesn't work. The show doesn't work, and that's it. And we ended up with you know with with a naked actress you know in my mom's mind, and that's it. And and with you know with me ashamed of my mom, but that's it. <laughs> but and and it's and it's and it's horrible because this is a, a moment where the theater. Who's suppo which is supposed to be very supportive and very liberal, and you know, and the National Theater to stand for, for his writers and not for the Minister of Culture, Minister of Culture. They realized that they need to do something, but she didn't say anything about it. They just censorized themselves in mm. order to protect themselves. Mm. And and it's a shame. It's horrible. I, you know, I, for, it was a big, it was a very traumatic event for me and for the director. Mm. We just, you know, I cried a lot, and then I realized why. Why are you crying? Because, but you know. Well, my wife asked me the other day, why are we uh, spending two hundred dollars a year on our New York Times subscription? You know, the, and I, <laughs> and I said, I said I consider it a donation. Um, I think they're saving the country, and I'm okay spending two hundred dollars a year on that. Um, and I, 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 I think that now what's interesting is that um, I don't know if I'm going to connect all these well, but um, Amichai Lalavi, who's one of the folks here on another panel, talked about the golden calf as a tragic story of the first great communal funded art project of the Jewish people <laughs> being destroyed by our leaders. And I think there's something so deep and, and worthy of of uh, exploration in that interpretation of the story. Because ultimately, I feel like we, we've been talking, and I probably I, I framed it as this question about culture, and are we, is there a way that we can build a, a new way of thinking about Jewish culture? But there's another piece about art, which is that it's not necessarily about building culture. It's about an avant-garde. It's about being transgressive. It's about being on the leading edge of something, even unintentionally. And, I have mixed feelings because on the one hand, I want there to be more support for that kind of art because we need it. And on the other hand, maybe it's the, the, the bravery and the willingness to go walk through fire in order to do your art that's what great artists do. And the way that we make sure that we have great artists is by putting obstacles in their path and seeing which ones get through them. <laughs> Um, I don't feel great about that because it causes a lot of suffering for people like us, but I wouldn't discount it either. And um, I'm not sure how we fold that back into the golden calf story, um, except to say that maybe someone like, um, like Korach, who comes back again and tries again to, you know, right? Maybe he was really a great artist because he, he, he took another crack at it. Uh, after it had already, you know, his grandson was a musician, so it was a yeah. Line, you know, right? I, I, I don't know, but but I think that um, I think, I, and on the other hand, right, I understand if you're the government, if you're the if you're the establishment, I understand you're feeling threatened by those artists, and um, and it's like, well, what are you supposed to do? What are what is human nature to do? Um, but try to sort of shut it down. And I guess I, I, guess I wonder if um, there's a way in which some of this is ultimately about uh, sort of deep failures and problems in our societies. Like I'll, I'll say about, about America, because I've been thinking a lot about America lately. And, and I'm a lawyer. You know, I'm trained as a, as a constitutional lawyer. My education was to say how beautiful the American Constitution is and how powerful it has been to have kept America going for 200 years. And what I feel like I've learned over the last couple of years is that it actually wasn't the Constitution that was doing that work. It was, it was some cultural sense of proper behavior. And when that, 
when something happens to make that proper, that, that sense of how a good person should behave, when, when that can be transgressed, it the, the, turns out the Constitution doesn't have the power to, to, to save us. Um, and wow. and, I, and I, it, it turns out, you know, it, and, and I, guess that, I guess that where I'm struggling in this is that, that I feel like in both societies, we underappreciate art. We, we think that art is there to entertain us as opposed to understanding that art is part of the constitutive pieces of a good society, just like journalism. It, we understand, I think, in a deep way in America that journalism is part of, is part of our governmental structure in a way. I, I think we would have a better society if we understood art to be the fifth estate, perhaps. And I think in Israel, the issue of journalism is even more complicated because it's not just the government, it's also money. Yeah, I mean, um, my husband is a journalist, and he also makes uh, documentaries. And his last documentary was shortlisted to the Oscar. I'm very proud of him. So I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm a PR person because he doesn't say anything about himself. He's really modest. And and his last, I mean, his new film, uh, it was screened here like uh, four four weeks ago in the Silicon Valley Jewish Film Festival. It's called the uh, uh, um, Foreign Land in, in English. Oh, you saw it? Yeah. Okay. Foreign, so foreign land. land. Foreign land. Yes. Uh, foreign land. Yeah. Eretz Zara in Hebrew, and and Miri. I mean, and and he's he's a great journalist. Not because he's my husband. I, but <laughs> no, I, I didn't contribute anything to his ability. But um, but he's a, he's a great journalist because he covered for over twenty years. He covered Gaza Strip, and. Um, and he won many prizes, and he, I, I don't know if you remember the story of uh, Dr. Izadin Abu Elesh, the man, the doctor, the, the uh, Palestinian doctor that lost his three daughters and was shouting on, over the phone. So my husband was the guy who picked up the phone and, and, you know, and pushed the speaker and let people hear Abu Elesh. So uh, in a way, uh, and, and Miri Regev, the Minister of Culture, she, you know, she attacked him personally that he, he will destroy Israel with his film, with his documentary. Yeah, right. I mean, the Syrian didn't destroy Israel, so a documentary will destroy the country. Yeah, right. But, you know, but it, it was so crazy, and she didn't even watch the film. Someone told her that there is a film about, you know, about art, and about, it's about, it's about an Arab actor, and about the similarity. I mean, it ended up with the similarity between the states and and Israel, uh, so you know, sometimes they just they just enjoy it. Politicians they enjoy it. And they don't even watch the, the they don't even watch the film. They she didn't watch the film. She never watched my show. She never watched the show. In it, it, does it because she can, and because it it helps her. She doesn't want to be number five in the Likud party. She wants to be number two. And. If we play the same game as she plays, or you know, politicians play, it's, we just need to keep doing things, keep doing things, keep doing things without being afraid, and and you know, to stand for our right to do things. This is the important thing. And if you go to the theater and you and you, and you, and you go and you watch things that, that, and that's it, that's it. This is because as long as you have an audience, you win. As long, I mean, if, if, if the place is empty, you have lost. If, you, if the place is packed, if the venue is packed, you win. We win. Can I, can I ask you, I, that actually raises something that I've been trying to, trying to think about and, and make a distinction in terms of leadership. And I, I've been trying to set it up as a, a rabbi is one kind of leader and an artist is another kind of leader. Apologies to rabbis on the okay. panel who this <laughs> won't fit. But, but I mean, classically, the, the, the rabbinical notion of leadership is that I have earned a place of authority, and I can tell you what you ought to be doing. You might not do it, but I can tell you what you ought to be doing. This is less so in liberal Judaism. Um, and, um, but an artist sa similarly says, I, I have a big idea about what you should be doing or what this is, but I'm offering it to you. And if you don't want it and you don't show up in the theater, it's, 
I failed. You, it's not that you failed, right? You didn't fail to do what you were. And, and I, I guess part of me is wondering whether a model of artist as leader would be beneficial to us in this Jewish moment. Well, I wish, but, you know, but at the same time, in many, many cases, even, I don't look at, take Meryl Streep as an example, okay? I'm not talking about someone that no one knows. Uh, when, she, when she said what she said about Trump, it was very powerful. It was powerful not because it it it's it, it wasn't because what she said was you know so powerful but because of her position and if you have I mean if you earned a position then use it at least use it I, you can see I mean with LeBron James as a leader okay because basketball is also a culture sport is a culture it has to do with culture if you already do if you already, you know, you made your mark, use it. Why not using it? Uh, because, yeah, art has to do with moral issues. Otherwise, otherwise it's, it's an entertainment. And there is a big difference between entertainment and art. Entertainment, it's nice. I admire good entertainment. But entertainment is supposed to make you forget. And art supposed to make you remember. Mm. I think I made it. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. This, is, this has really been, been wonderful. And I am very flattered that Daniel thinks I'm an artist, because all I can do as a liberal rabbi is say, here, would you like? Mm. But I promise questions. And this is question number one. Question. <laughs> Broadway fans. Dan Reichen. Well, maybe we'll let you respond to the question of why is Israeli culture making such an impact, do you think, right now? Because is it's about a, Israel or America? No, because it's good. It's well, good. It's not only good, it's I mean, I've personally been involved with, with bringing film directors, right. producers. Right, so let, let's let our panel answer the question. To, to train people to Good. So let's let our panel answer yeah. the question. Well, first, Israel, it's, it's heaven for documentaries. First of all, it's, it's like it's the best place ever for documentary. And also, I mean, there are very, the whole thing about Israel, it's, the, it's very talented people. And also people who can mix between tons of cultures. Because if you have like, someone who was born in Russia and made Aliyah in the age of 10, and he lives in Israel now, okay? So he has Russian, in his, you know, Russian culture in his background, Israeli culture, and then all the influence of American culture on Israel. And all of a sudden, you have a, you know, a man of the world, which is amazing. It is amazing. You get to meet so many talented people because it's a very, first it's a very small country. So you need, to meet a, you need to meet everyone. It's not like here. Here you can live your whole life in a place, in the same place, and, and, you, know, and you can travel around New York and feel like that if you go to the Bronx, then you probably, you, 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 a brand new culture. But in, in, in Israel, you get to meet everyone because it's such a tiny place. And you go to the army and you serve with other people that are completely different than you are. 
and it has a lot of influence on your life. And you turn and, and, and you, you know, you pick up from here and from there and from here and from there. And all of a sudden, you're, you're a very, very, not only a gifted person, but, you know, a full person full with all these things, with all these ideas. And also, I think that it has to do a lot with, with the way we talk. We talk to each other. We share ideas. It's crazy the way we talk. I, I meet Israelis. It's like after two minutes, we have an idea for a startup, for something. Let's work about it. Let's meet together. All of, you know, all of a sudden, we create a world. And, and it's because we, there is a, something about Israeli character that, that you know, makes you immediately feel connected. And you share ideas and everything, and, and, and it doesn't even take time. I mean, all of, after an hour, you, you find yourself in a position where you, you, you signed up a contract with someone that you didn't know before. <laughs> and, and that, I mean, television, look at the television war, it's amazing. Uh, I, I, just, I just signed up a contract with Keshet I, um, for, uh, for a TV series, and it's amazing. Immediately they think about, they, didn't, they don't even think about Israel anymore. They're like, it goes to the international department. I was like, I didn't even write, you know, one line. <laughs> the international department, you know, let's, let's wait. And, she, and, and the, the CEO, she said, no, 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 no. That's how it works now. You know, we think if, if it works, if we can think about it as something that works for the world, then we sign a contract. If not, if it's only... Is, then we don't do it. We think out, you know, we just want to spread, spread the world. So, I, I, All I want to say question. is that I want to read the Edgar Carrot story about how uh, Salman Rushdie recommended him. Like, that sounds like a great Edgar Carrot story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's hear all three questions. Okay, we're going to hear all three questions because time is short, and then we'll let uh, them answer all three of them. Okay, good. We have one question. Did you have a question over there? Well, certainly in your husband's movie. Yeah. Uh, there was one more question over here. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, let's start from the beginning, I guess. Um, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. We like to think of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem as two different countries. But it, it, it is and it isn't. Because we speak the same language, we do share the same, you know, some values. <laughs> And uh, I thought, for example, that my satire, I will not be able to, you know, to put it on stage in, in the occupied territories, for example. But I felt like I need to do that. So I actually called myself to the uh, manager, to the guy who runs the venue in Malé Domim and in Ariel. And I told them, listen, guys, come and watch it. At least come and watch it. If you will tell me that it's not suitable for your audience, then I will understand it. I will accept it. And the guy from Ariel called me back. And he said I was in the States. And he called me back. He didn't understand because I have this Israeli number. It's, you know, it's an Israeli combination. How, how do you do things? But I have a number. I have an Israeli number. So he called me. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. So I picked up the phone. He said, hi, it's Ariel. How are you? <laughs> and I said, Immediately, I said, oh, how are you doing? You know, like, I, I, no, I didn't sleep. No. So, uh, and he said, listen, I watched the, I, I went to see it. It's great. I love it. I want to ask you something. Will the Arab guy, will he will come to perform in Ariel? And I said, who's the Arab guy? 
And he said, the guy, the actor, the Arab, I, I said, his name is Sharon Friedman. What are you talking about? <laughs> and not only is Jewish, he was in, you know, in, a, in, in the army. It's like, and because he, he, he has this wonderful Arabic accent that no one can recognize as, as, as Jewish. So I was like, I was like, and then I realized that he was wor I was worried about him, and he was worried about me, about us. And they went to perform in Ariel, and they went to perform in Maale Domim. And they sat on stage, and they had a long talk with the audience, which said, you know, sometimes we felt uncomfortable, sometimes it wasn't very nice to hear or to watch. But at least they were trying to talk to each other. Let the audience decide. Don't decide for your audience. And this is something we have to remember. And as for, as for distribution, uh, it's fun. You know, it's fun that you're able to send like a link to your show and people can watch it. It's great. Uh, it makes things easier. But um, you don't write. I, I, you don't write, you don't think about being successful in the States. You write because you need to write, because you want to write, because it's fun. For me, it's fun. I don't know. Some people find it, you know, a burden, but it's not a burden. It's fun. So I write because it's fun. And, and I realize that if you write for yourself, it's great. When you write for others, it will always sound and look like, you know, like, a leaflet, like, you know, like a, an agenda. You don't write an agenda, you write a book or... Very last word, and I think we need to vacate some of it. Yeah, I would just say about distribution that I think it's interesting to connect to the, the point about the international department in the, in the TV studio, that I think we, and, and maybe it brings it full circle, because I think in understanding the new media that we have available to us and the way that, um, that art can be distributed in, in new ways, uh, it, it provides an opportunity. Like it's fascinating to think of Israeli artists who are who are TV writers, uh, writing for a world audience, um, and you know, doing a podcast. You you realize that um, it's so much cheaper to to do and to distribute, but it still costs money. But it's actually hard to raise the money because nobody understands what a podcast is. You could raise <laughs> twenty times as much money for a play than for a podcast, even though the podcast is going to. Uh, reach 20 times as many people. So it's so we're in this really interesting uh, transitional space right now. But but I think that the question of distribution is, is a really interesting one because it, it has a chance to to take uh, to that not only because it has a chance to distribute this stuff widely, but once we know that it's being distributed widely, it changes the nature of the thing itself, and and maybe that'll be a fruitful area for experimentation. Thank you both very much. It's really been a fascinating. Thank you. Session.